Welcome to a Data Mesh Learning Panel hosted in conjunction with the Data Mesh Radio Podcast. This is a panel where we ask members of the general data community to discuss a specific topic where we can have people that drill down and give their opinions instead of just kind of having these one-on-one -on -one discussions such as the interviews on the uh, Data Mesh Radio podcast. These, the people that are on these panels are only representing their own views to be clear, but it's important to have more and more perspectives come in. And so we are looking to do a number of these panels in 2023. So if you have a top or and or you want to participate in a panel, please do get in touch. You can find me in the Slack. We'll also be having the new uh, team that is going to be owning and, and kind of running the community. They're going to be looking for additional people as well to do content like this. I want to make clear as well, people from underrepresented groups are especially welcome as panel participants. So with that as the uh, little bit of introduction to the background around this, please do enjoy this awesome panel with some great members of the general data community. So welcome to uh, an introduction to data user experience. Our goal today is really about holding an open discussion about user experience as it applies to data uh, specifically. And for this session, we're going to do about an hour of questions and then follow it with Q&A at the end, but I really want this to be feel conversational. So if you have a question, please feel free to drop it into the Q&A. Um, at the bottom of the screen instead of chat. If they go into chat, we tend not to see them. And it's difficult for us to kind of uh, moderate that and, and check off which ones have been answered. So feel free to drop your questions in there and uh, we may answer them as we go along, but if not, we'll try and get to the questions at the end. So I'm gonna jump right in and do uh, introductions and, and uh, then we'll get into um, introducing the other folks here on the call as well. So my name is Karen Passwar. I'm the CEO of Predictive UX. So we're a UX and data consultancy. I've been in the industry for about 25 years, working primarily with Fortune 500 companies on their content and data initiatives. A large part of that has been focused on the user experience of those initiatives. And I'm excited to be here today uh, with the, my co-panelist, Alice and Juanes. So I'm gonna turn it over to them for introductions. And Alice, why don't we start with you? Hi, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited for today's topic. Um, I am originally from the UK. I live in Norway. Uh, I work as a data engineer on the data platform at DMB, which is Norway's largest bank. Um, I have a have had a bit of a career hop, uh, a shift from I did a bachelor's in international politics and then um, worked a few years in marketing before um, doing a master's in human computer interaction, which is, um, I guess, often seen as UX. Um, and we can discuss that. And so I wrote on exactly this topic here. So very excited for this. Yeah, great Anna? to have you here. Uh, thanks as well. Uh, and also looking forward, I think it's... Uh a quite new yet very relevant topic so i'm very curious to to hear your words as well uh, i myself i have a quite broad background uh, i've been cto have been product manager i have been head of data in in multiple companies i think most relevant is in that i'm currently head of product at Rito, a product startup trying to have a solution to cover access to your data wherever it lives um, but my connection to the data mesh community is the data mesh roadmap we had at TPG Media, the largest Benelux media company, um, where we've published quite a lot of content, been on the meetup before as well, um, and always looking to share some knowledge around data mesh, but even more particular today about uh, data products and user experience. That's great. Exciting to hear everyone's perspectives on, on the questions that we've prepared. So we have some questions that we're going to answer. Again, just for those who are newly joining, we welcome your questions and feedback. And if you have a question while we're uh, chatting here, just put your questions into the Q&A uh, section, and then we'll get to those as we can or at the end of the session. So, uh, you know, the reason we're here is to talk about data UX. And one of the first questions that we want to go over is really, you know, what is data UX? So um, 
since you're drinking one us, I'll go to Alice <laughs> and ask you to get us started. <laughs> what, in your opinion, is data UX? Well, UX stands for user experience. So it's about the user experience, I would say, for those working in data and their experiences of how they interact with data. And then we can begin to think about who, who are those users? So where does user experience actually go? Is it those end users um, or is it further up? Um, um, is it broader and uh, can it encompass everything about data and people who work with data and improving their experiences? Yeah, when you say the users, uh, what does that mean to you, like data users in your mind? So for me, I would say um, if you're working with data, you're a data user. Um, but there's different roles and that means we can think about different personas so we can break down who they are and what their aims are and maybe what their technical skill level is. So we have consumers, their users. These consumers may be end business users, uh, for example, accountants or um, auditors. They may be um, uh, business analysts or data analysts. They may be um, data scientists. They may be data engineers. Um, they may be producers of data. So they may be software engineers or data engineers again. Uh, they may be data scientists who are producing data to be consumed elsewhere. Um, there's architects. There's also data stewards, privacy stewards. Um, there's business owners. All these people interact with data. So it sounds to me mm -hmm. like if you, you touch data, you're you're a user of data, right? And in, in yes. the context of user experience. Yeah. Yes. Great. That's thorough. And I agree completely. Juanes, what is your view of, of what data UX is? Yeah, I think Alice already touched upon quite a lot, um, but maybe important to stress, although she, she, she actually mentioned it, it's about how you use data, your experience as a user touching with data. It's not necessarily how you use data. It's not about user experience of your data platform. Uh, when you talk about data, UX, it's about how you interact with the data. And of course, that happens via a platform probably, but it's about how your data is modeled, how it's offered to you, what do you want to do with it? How, how do you use it in your, in your daily business? Not how you technically interact with it. It's, it's typically from a, from a value driven perspective with regards to your data. Yeah, I agree. And something that always comes to mind for me when we're working on data initiatives is, you know, as we're talking about how people are using data, it, the word actionable comes to mind constantly. How do we make this data actionable? How do we make it valuable? And how do we turn data into knowledge? So it's that transition of, you know, disparate sources of data coming from all of these different locations and people's minds and systems, putting them into a context for where the user is on their journey, right? So seeing the right data at the right time based on where you are and what you need, but then how do you make that actionable? And a core focus for us is always on how do you uh, build systems, or I'm really interested in anyway, how you can build systems where <clears throat> I, I get what I need the minute I see it. <laughs> I don't wanna have to take the data and pull it, it like, great, I found the data, but now I have to pull it out and put it into a third party system, which is the problem we're often trying to solve, right? How do you get data from all these systems together so I can do something with it? And it's still to me not really, we're not really doing data UX effectively if people are getting to that data and then still pulling it out into an Excel spreadsheet or a third party platform. So I really think it's about focusing on making that data experience valuable um, inside of the platform where users are accessing the information. <clears throat> so, uh, um, yeah, it's also up to the technical level, as Alice already talked. If, if you look to the entire chain of data users, for, for some it's fine to have indeed even have such a download to Excel. I, I'm a terrible disbeliever of Excel, but I think for some it works fine. Um, for others, it's a reporting tool where you will interact. For others, it's a SQL uh, database layer. So th that's also some thing to think about as well how, how are your people going to interact with your data but as you said in one single place where they can immediately get value and, and actionable data insights 
Yeah, and and you're right. That's a good point. Sometimes when we're looking at the user experience, and not sometimes, always, we're looking at the business process, right? What are you doing today? How does your what's your mental model? What systems are you using? And if we pull a system out of the process or change the mental models too drastically, then that process can get broken along the way. So it's important to focus on how the business is functioning today, what external systems they're using, and make sure that the new experiences are aligning with that so that they can still be productive and efficient in what they're doing. This is where data UX really um, starts to help because you can break down how they intend to use it and what's their purpose and their thought process. So um, uh, you can begin to think like, um, how do they know that that data exists? For example, where are they going to find it? Um, and well, how are they going to understand that's the right data and understand the data they're working with? And then um, how are they going to work with it? Is it in the right format? Is it in the form? Mm -hmm. Is it in the right system? Uh -huh. And then are they going to trust it when they work with it? And those four make it um, uh, usable in a way for them. I agree. Building on that idea, at what point do you feel the UX comes into the process when you're starting a new data project? Like when is the right time? And a, a lot, oftentimes, you know, um, at least for us, we've been brought in after technology has been selected, sometimes already implemented. And then, you know, we're asked to fix maybe a system that is broken. It's not working. People aren't getting the data they need or want or you know, they don't, they don't have enough data. There's so many different things, right? Or to your point, they don't trust the data. So when do you think the right time is to approach the user experience? Wannis, would you like to start? Yeah, definitely. Um, when I hear you talking about technology, I, I think it doesn't really matter. I think you can reach most of your goals with whichever technology, as long as it supports the idea of getting value out of data in one single place where you have brought other things together. Um, of course, it also matters if you set up a complete data initiative, a, a new data strategy, maybe at a company that also includes user experience. And then you want to be uh, from day one involved, but there's already, there's also a bunch of data initiatives, building new data products when technology is already selected. And that's not an issue at all. I think if if you look how it typically goes is you have someone using a sandbox environment testing out an ID is is there value in this data with regards to a certain uh, certain use case having in mind that's fine to to do that without the user experience in mind um it's testing out it's it's a hypothesis testing is there value in what I'm going to do but from the moment you've validated that and you want to productionalize or uh, make it even make it more mature and make it continuously actionable i think that's the moment where you need to pull in uh, user experience because from from that moment on you want to enable multiple people to continuously get the same kind of value out of your data and your data product so taking uh, a look at consistency and how that data is being consumed, do you mean, or uh, just consistency in terms of the value? Um, probably both. Uh, what, what you want to reach, of course, is consistency and the value. Um, insights you have today, you, you want to ha keep having at least the same amount of value from, the, from that same insight. I do believe it's easier to standardize the way of consumption to reach that goal it's it's not a necessity though um, but i do believe it just makes things a bit easier mm -hmm. yeah and alice how about you what's your opinion on when the right time is to start approaching the user experience well when i first started thinking about this i was thinking well right from the start but i think one has made a really good point about there's already processes going on and i think there's no reason why not to start on things that if if you haven't started right at the start, you can always start now in a project that's already begun. Um, but I think probably it's maybe more important to think about how it's valued rather than when it starts and making sure that the user 
uh, requirements that you begin to draw up um, begin to take on the same amount of importance as technical requirements and business requirements. Um, and that's that's where the um, impact of data usability can uh, really come into play when when it's really considered as uh, vital to um, to the project, if if you call it that. Um, and be basically, because if no one's um, going to use it because it's not usable, why did you start? Um, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> no one's going to be using the data. And I think that's a big problem people are facing today in organizations. The conversation is always around um, connecting data, right? And then you have to ask the question, why are we connecting this data? What do we hope to get from it? You know, what, what's our hypothesis here? And I think one of the nice things about user experience is it can answer those hypotheses, right? It can help test out, you know, are we going to get from this data what we expect to get from it once it's all connected? And then how are we going to how are we going to leverage it and what systems? So I agree with both of you, uh, you know, what you said about when the right time is. I'm biased as well towards what you were saying, Alice, initially, like at the beginning, of course, we want to start with the end user needs in mind. Uh, but Juanis makes a great point, too, um, to echo what you said, that any time is a good time to do user experience, right? I think doing it is is the the big thing, is making sure you're looking at who the users are and what the value is to them, aligning that to the business value, and also looking at, you know, the technical impact. We want to make sure that, you know, what we're envisioning from a user experience perspective when we're saying we're connecting all of this different types of uh, data from different domains together and potentially in one dashboard and it's going to be this great thing, right? But uh, we, we have to make sure that the technical lift makes sense for it. You know, it's not going to be too expensive for the value you're going to get from it, but also that the people who are consuming that data actually want to consume it in that format, right? In some kind of dashboard and that's that's really where they want to get it from. So. Anytime is a good time to engage. And uh, ideally, though, I think when you're considering any kind of uh, data product project where people are going to be accessing data to do their jobs, and you know, that's you, it, just having that conversation informally even is better than not doing anything at all, right? And just understanding where people are coming from. Yeah, so I know to, to, to hop in on this. Uh, I think maybe we even say exactly the same thing because I, I was stating what you want to do is you enable people to have sandbox testing out stuff before you productionalize and that's where you you add in. But actually that sandboxing is the preparation, it's the, that, the data gathering for UX, for UX as well. It's making sure that there's value and what's the value you want to get out of it. So it's it's already gathering the input for your UX experts later on as well. This kind of reminds me of design thinking a bit where, you know, design thinking is a framework we can employ in user experience work. And design thinking is cool to me because you can pick it up at any point in the in the framework. You don't have to follow it linear, linearly. And when I think about user experience, when it comes to data, there is a framework I like to follow. And I'm just methodical, you know, having been a consultant for most of my career. Everything starts with current state, right? Where are you today? And then where do you want to be? And let's, you know, if we have baselines and benchmarks and best practices we can compare it to and maturity that we're talking about, it's really good to go, you know, look at the current state and, and fill that gap between current state and where you're trying to get in the future state. But, uh, you know, and that's where all of my UX thinking starts, just understanding who's involved and what we're, what we're dealing with and where we want to go. But, you know, really from there, um, anyone can have, the, you know, can follow that approach and ask those questions and get at the heart of, you know, where the blockers are for what you're trying to do with the data as well, which I think is really important when it comes to user experience. It's not just about the happy path. And I think oftentimes it's really easy with, with any user experience, not just data, but particularly with data. It's really easy to look at if we, like I said before, we create that dashboard, there's the happy path, we get to the dashboard, we have success, but there's so much more after that and around it. And data um, for me is really different than something, um, some other kinds of projects because with data, it's information system at such an, it's system design at such an intense level with an immense amount of cognitive strain and mental workload required to imagine how this can all fit together. 
Uh, and then think about things like the structure of data, especially if you're dealing with unstructured data and getting it into a user interface in a way that's then going to make sense to that person on the other side when like in your head, you know the complexity of everything in the background and you're trying to narrow all that down into just the simplest form while still being really highly usable and valuable. And so just just a statement on my thoughts around <laughs> the and what you said about the design thinking. I think that was very relevant, really it, the importance of just iterating and um, like in academia, they use um, action design um, science to um, to recognize that when you begin to build an artifact, that will begin to have an effect on you and you may not be able to foresee some of the the predict and um, predict what may come out because as you build you will change and recognizing the role and the the interaction that you have with what you build uh, will develop over time as well so being aware of this uh, and how how the product changes as well is uh, uh, important Right. Yeah. And I think that with with user experience, the interesting part for me is modeling out every unique scenario, because that's really what's involved when you're designing a data product for uh, users to consume information and take action on that information. We're we're looking at all of those use cases and, and scenarios down to the user story level of, you know, what could happen? What different paths can I go down? How do I make sense of this? And also, is this consistent with how the experience operates in other places in the application or where else this data is showing up, right? So there's a lot of complexity built into modeling all of that out. And I find it endlessly fascinating and fun to do that <laughs> because it's such a meaty problem to solve. So Alice, um, just kind of picking up on some of the things you were talking about just now, um, your thesis is about human-centered data architecture, and I'd love to hear more about what that means to you. Yeah, so um, I started with looking at data products and how we could make usable data products. And then I looked at microservices and, and tried to find some, because this is a very new topic. Uh, there's very little academia on it. So um, I dove into where where people are writing on microservices and was inspired from there and was beginning to work out that uh, as an ecosystem as a whole, it needs to, uh, so data, data architecture as a whole needs to be designed with the human in the middle, like human in the loop, if you prefer to machine learning. Um, and the consumer and the producer of data is, they're often taken as an afterthought in, when designing data architecture. And, if you begin to think how they interact and their experiences, their user experiences and their aims and design your architecture around them, uh, you will begin to uh, minimize risk, improve efficiency, um, and um, you'll extract your data values, the value from your data, um, hopefully more efficient, effectively and um, with more satisfaction as well for your engineers. When um, you're yeah. saying data architecture, are you say are you referring? I just want to level set on the definition. Yeah. Do you mean a data model or taxonomy? You know, what what specifically are you talking about there for the engineers who are putting the data model together or or architecture? Excuse me. <laughs> so I mean um, the whole system, the whole. Um, so if you think about um, all your business um, data in different parts of your organization and how they interact together because data is becoming more and more software-like. So how would your software architecture look and, and how closely is it to your operational data systems? And so when I, so really data is the whole architecture where data is um, considered. Like where it's yeah. living, where the pipelines are yes. and things like that. Gotcha, okay, fascinating. Juanes, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Alice makes a, a great point here. Um, if you typically look to data UX and it's already truly data UX, you typically end up with the end products, the, the dashboards where 
actually business users are interacting. Um, but if you look indeed to the connection between producers and consumers, how does data, data get there? How does it go throughout the entire pipeline? Um, it often hasn't been thought of, um, most often because there was previously before the, the concept of data mesh, more one central data team that just goes picks on data, they completely make it their own and then they, they end up. Whereas now you get those interactions between the entire pipeline. You have data producers responsible to offer already some data products, which will never be used by an internal end user. Uh, if you think someone owning the CRM system might offer a data product, this is what a customer is within our company, but no single report will be based on that data product. No, you'll have data product on top of data product before it gets to the end user and how they interact gives you an entire different, um, meaning about the user experience on, on, on that single place. So I, I think indeed looking from that perspective, from a human perspective, what do I need to get everything in there? Where do I need this intervention? Who's my user at every point within that chain is a, is a very valuable topic. I agree. And as you were describing that, it, it immediately made me think about how, you know, you're, you said there's data product on top of data product before it gets to the end consumer. And there's this idea of, you know, if you're planning it out at the organizational level, the architecture from an organizational level, you know, you have different sources of data about, you know, a user, for example, and you're pulling, like you said, something from a CRM or another transactional system, and those get coupled together to create that end product for the consumer. And then there's some data normalization that may need to take place there, especially if, you know, these systems, everybody might agree they should be, you know, the same, or, you know, we want to adjust our models, but it takes time to get there, right? This is a fairly new idea. So everyone's kind of coming from the um, sort of stovepiped mentality and now, you know, um, creating uh, more, more access, right, to data from those do data domain experts, but it's still, there's a need, you know, while we're, while we're trying to decentralize, there's still a need to centralize the data models themselves and describing the um the data so the metadata really and putting that into the user experience in a way that users can understand right it creates that information sent in the system lets me know that i found the right the right um core source of data that i can trust and i know data trust is a really big factor that we've come across when we're looking at system design where we're ingesting multiple uh, data sources and even enabling uh, users sometimes to change the data source so they can see for themselves does this really look the same can i compare these two which do i feel more confident in using so yeah it's a it's an important important piece to take into consideration and i'm curious if either of you have um you know when you think about human-centered data architecture you know where this conversation or this question sort of started when you're thinking about the architecture diagram, um, do you do you have something in mind that's like a, a best practice framework to follow for creating something like that? Or is this something that you think is more organic and specific to each organization? I'll start with you, Juanes. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it will grow organically uh, most often um, because if you truly look from a from a technology perspective and really software architecture perspective as said i don't believe there's any restrictions to any tools some are more usable than others within this setup where you really push certain uh, competences or push governance left for example um yet i don't think there's there's a true restriction but if you look to data model where you you as you were saying you want to have certain data products on the same granular level uh, to give an example i was working at a media company um having newspapers where a user is a physical person and we had a streaming service as well where a user is a household because you have multiple profiles you you can no longer compare them um and this is something where you want to grow towards each other but really enforce it as from day one this is what's going to happen probably won't work and 
there's no company where you can start from scratch doing this. Um, so, so this needs to get aligned organically, I guess, from, from a data model perspective. Yeah, that's a really great example. That's that's perfect. And interesting to think about uh, the, the right folks who need to be involved in those conversations. Uh, so building on that further, uh, Alice, you know, when you think about doing something like looking at the different data sources and normalization or developing this architecture, who would you imagine being involved um, in an ideal situation and those kinds of conversations? Um, I think right now, as this is very early um, idea to get people to think about the users, we start with um, the consumers and the producers. Um, and there's a, there's a really good um, diagram that um, I adapted from a vendor, so um, I can't share it right now, but let, I'll try and link it for people to see. Um, and it starts with um, the producers at the top. And so I like to think of this in a life cycle process of the data product. So you have your producers at the top and you have your consumers at the bottom. Together, they identify a business value. So a little bit like how one says, so like um, uh, with a sandbox and, and so on. And then the producers, they create a data product. Um, then they're going to secure and deploy that data product and describe it in a responsible way. Uh, then the consumers then go and um, they can discover that data product. They can, um, then they need to understand it, uh, trust and comply with it. And at the same time, the producers can then uh, monitor, audit and um, have observability of that um, data product in conservation. And um, then uh, they can also assist and advise on it. And the, finally, they get the business value from the consumers do get this business value out of the data product and the life cycle continues. And using that model really helps to think about how you begin um, to look at data usability in different aspects of the whole life cycle. So using the life cycle perspective one has really helped us so far. So um, mm -hmm. remind me if I forget, but I'll, I'll try and link what we um, adapted from a vendor. I love what you said. And as you were talking about that, it naturally led me to think about, um, is that something you would see, and this is a question for both of you, is this something that you would see incorporating uh, different data uh, producers across the organization together who are managing different data products or just one at a time individually? I think it's important to do this together as well. Um, because you're moving towards as this the same example holds if you have streaming data sitting within one business and you have one data product around that and then readers is a different data product if you don't do it together they will never align so it's it's about making sure that certain data products connect um, maybe not all maybe you can have them a bit grouped per domain or something like that um, but it's important they talk to each other and maybe to answer on the previous questions you you'd ask who's being involved there um, although in general i'm a firm believer in a in a bottom-up approach i think here it's you really need someone high the end kpi owner what's really relevant for you is this a household is this a person he's the one that can make a, a decision high level about one domain um, but as I said, I, I think it's important to do this with multiple data products at once to make sure they're aligned. You can make them interoperable, um, having the end goal in mind as well. Mm -hmm. I would love to agree with you, but I'm actually going to uh, throw in some, you know, uh, as a new graduate, something that really shocked me was uh, the, the technical debt that uh, super large organizations face. And, so yes i came in with this optimism that yes we can change this data product and then we can change that and then it is so large that i have to accept that we are not going to change one value chain at the same time and uh we will take months just to educate or find them 
but we can start and gradually go and take, yes, maybe one value chain at a time. Um, but it'll also take a very long time. And some will go at a faster level because of the technical debts that some will have. And it would it would be fantastic to um, say that user, we can, they can all go at the same speed. But um, no, some, you, you some, some, for example, the Cobalt developers will, uh, will not make their data products as usable um, at the same rate that, um, as someone working um, with the latest technology. No, true. Um, you can't expect that. And, and you're completely right. You will have technical debt where you cannot change as rapidly as, as desired. And you might have multiple technologies as you're stating. That doesn't mean you need to, you don't need to involve everyone from day one. Where yes. are we heading? What's, what's the end goal? Um, and even though one data product can't change within the few next months, at least already decide together, yes, but our granular level is going to be a person, a household, to come back to the example. This is what we agree upon right now so that uh, everyone can move forward. Um, because indeed there's a, a difference in speed. Um, yeah, what you were saying, we cannot focus on one more than one value chain at a time is probably right. But I don't think one value chain maps on one data product. One value chain has data products built on top of data products. Yes. Anyway, you're rebuilding multiple data products at a time, probably to indeed focus on that one value chain. Um, so even at that point, you need to bring some people together to to make sure that the end value chain which you desire to to change can be worked upon. I like your optimism um, too, and and it, because that really um, allows you to like, yeah, bring them into the room. I think that's that's sensible, even even if they are going to change at a slower rate. Um, that's we leverage. Oh, go ahead. We leverage workshops for this type of activity. It's really been very effective for us. And I, when I talked with Scott, and we did um, our data mesh radio conversation with him, I talked a lot about content management and uh, everything around data these days really reminds me of the transformation that we went through with content management where it was siloed and then it you know converged and then it's like kind of going back out and being decentralized again. And um, But through that process, there were a lot of different groups in an organization who needed to come together and align on things like how does content get created? How do we track the metadata around it? What's our workflow look like? How does it get published? Who has access to it? Um, where can it show up? Who can see it, right? And as we went through that transformation for many years, you know, lots of organizations had to transform and change everything about the way they thought about all of the activities they were doing to create content or data in those cases and um, get them into systems and into a governance model that worked across the entire organization. And we would work with organizations who needed content, you know, spread out to 21 different, you know, websites, for example, um, all created in one system. But at the time we started, it was created all over the place. So, um, you know, just borrowing from that and moving into um, data, then the same process works really well where you do workshop settings and that's when that education takes place, right? Let's talk about what we're talking about. <laughs> Let's define the things that we're trying to achieve. You know, what is a data consumer, a data uh, producer? What is governance? What's a data pipeline? What's availability or accessibility? And then working through looking at, uh, you know, how structured is your data? Are, are you on-prem or in the cloud? And, you know, what are your blockers? And what, are, what is your vision? What's your roadmap currently look like? Current state kind of stuff. And then at least getting those conversations started. And then if you can come out of that with some type of governance model and vision defined that everyone can aspire to, that helps move everyone forward in, in the right direction together. So I'm agreeing with both of you on that. <laughs> you start with a group and then, you know, but also I think include everyone in the conversation is really important. Um, so we do have a question here. And this is uh, from Jay. He said, the value of a given consumer gets from a data product in part depends on their ability to understand it. It's like art. The more knowledge a viewer has about art history, the medium, other works by the artist, et cetera, the better they can appreciate it. 
So in other words, get value out of the art product they're exposed to. How do you build up the data consumer's capacity for data appreciation? So I have to think and process that. So how do, how do I get someone to appreciate data as much as they would appreciate art, assuming that their appreciation of the art here is based on their knowledge and understanding of art? Making sure I'm looking at that correctly. Can I jump in? Because I think that Definitely. this might um, be pointing um, on domain expertise and the transfer of knowledge uh, between different domains. And um, I always like to use an example to start on this was um, if I write down on a piece of paper for someone who's never ridden a bike, how do you ride a bike and write, tell them? They're going to really struggle to understand how they ride that bike. But if you show them um, or send them a video um, and really convey that knowledge that I have of riding a bike to them, they will learn to ride that bike quicker and they will then get that knowledge. So let's think about how we transfer the knowledge of domain expertise from one area to another. We're not just sharing the data, but we're sharing our knowledge. And um, to be able to interact, um, there's some research papers that have gone on and your data interaction is limited by how much domain expertise you have. Uh, but they worked out that um, you also have time and you also have conversation with data. So you may not have the domain expertise, but you could have some more conversation with that data and talk to it, SQL queries that you begin to interact with it more. And through that, you would build up your domain expertise. Of course, you will use up more time like this. So think of it as a triangle. Um, so thinking the way in which that domain expertise is, um, is shared with the data is um, crucial. Yeah. Yeah, I think about, oh, go ahead. I think you're absolutely right. It's about getting people together and understanding what they're doing and, and understanding what the artist does to to get to the to the piece of art. Um, and I'm really sorry, Jay, but I'm going to answer next to the question because I'm going to talk about producers. Um, if you see the data mesh story we had at DBG Media, we started off within one domain by getting data experts in a data producing team. Um, and in the beginning, you you kind of feel a struggle. Why do we as domain experts need to work together with uh, data craftsmen? Let, let's call it like this. What's in it for us? What's the value in it for us? Um, because they were obliged to make sure you build building blocks out of your source systems you own. They own the subscription system. What's a subscription? What's a customer? There's nothing in it for us. Two months later, first data products are there. Suddenly they saw the opportunity, yes, from these data products coming from the multiple source systems we have, we suddenly think of a new a new use case itself. So we've been working together with these guys. We now understand how data works, what, what you can do with data, and we immediately see a use case for ourselves. So instead of two months earlier having a bit of a struggle, why do we need to cooperate? Why do we suddenly become responsible yet we get data craftsmen in our team they became the advocate for data mesh you've put data engineers in in our domain and suddenly new use cases arise and faster than ever before and i guess the same holds a bit for for data consumers if you can make sure that indeed you bring technical data knowledge closer to them and as alice is saying you make sure you share domain uh, knowledge across domains you get people together and you get them to talk that's when they understand what's in it for them and and that's how you can make sure they start using what uh, what you've built i agree i think that's how or why i like the workshop setting so much is that it puts different people who are in different uh, roles within an organization in the room together from you know it's a top down bottom up approach right you're getting it all kind of at once and when you can start talking through ideas and then you have the engineers in the room who can speak to whether or not it's technically feasible and you have the business folks in there who are talking about why they need it to be feasible 
and user experience people talking about how it's going to interact, uh, how, how users are going to interact with it in the system. You kind of have all the pieces of the puzzle there to help everyone understand uh, the, the purpose, you know, what you're trying to achieve, but also um, what might be blocking it, what's going to make it successful. And it's always, to me, really interesting, just like this conversation here, you get to hear what other people's opinions and experiences are and they can bring that to the table to help you know just raise the awareness and education of everyone around the value of of data and how it can be utilized in an organization and most of the time when we're in workshop settings like that that's when the ideas just start firing like you were pointing out when it's, it's like all of the use cases are coming to the surface and suddenly we have a, we can see a lot of value there and an outcome of those types of workshops are usually things like you know, low fidelity wireframes to communicate these ideas that we're talking about visually or an architecture uh, model, high level architecture diagram or a concept diagram, as well as, um, you know, a roadmap for looking about, you know, everyone gets excited then, right? And says, how quickly can we get this thing that we're all talking about building? Thanks for the question, Jay, appreciate it. Uh, so one of our next questions here is, uh, what are some of the user experience challenges for data analytics? And I know, you know, we've kind of touched on this a couple of times in our conversation. It feels like when you say data, you, you're going to say analytics <laughs> at some point, right? There are other things you can do with data um, and uh, ways to work with data. But I know this question was something that um, I think came out of the, some of the conversations Scott was having in the data mesh community. So um, I don't know if either of you are more of an expert in analytics uh, or not, but Juanis, I'll start with you and see what your thoughts are about the UX challenges there. I think maybe the biggest challenge is the, the combination between what you want to offer within a data product and where we're heading as a culture or, a, or an expectation more and more towards uh, toward self-service and combine those two that that's a hard challenge because thinking from an analytics perspective how do i get this into a report one insight that everyone understands that's not the hardest thing that that's even something you can wireframe as, as you said before thinking of how do I build a data model that can serve multiple insights to a self-service environment. So not really knowing what the end user is going to create for himself and actually going to see that that's really harder. If, if you compare that with, uh, with purely web or app or whatever design where you can really state, I put a button here and this is how a user is going to interact with it. You're not always in the same situation here. If, if from the moment you've shifted to self-service analytics. Hmm, that's really interesting. I, I was thinking of analytics um, a little differently, but I like where you're going with it. And I, and I wanna reiterate to make sure I understood you correctly, that you're suggesting that uh, from an analytics perspective, the idea is that you're making the data available and people can do whatever they want with it from an ant to run whatever reports they want. It's not like a pre-canned dashboard experience where you're getting certain reports only. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I see as a challenge here is the amount and volume of data <laughs> and the speed and being able to um, control the cost and you know get people the information that they need and so you know a lot of times we're working with like really large systems and large amounts of data and there's a lot of hesitation people seem to have getting um, from the idea of uh, big data to connecting data using something like a knowledge graph and changing technologies to make um, speed and accessibility of data more available to the end users. So I think there's, um, you know, the size, speed, and cost kind of coupled with education. So how do you solve that problem without using, you know, the old tools and frameworks and methodologies and thinking, you know, getting modernizing the way um, people are thinking about data so that you can get to that place where your analytics are available in the different formats and ways that people want them in uh, and that the they're responsive, right? At scale, you can see these analytics. And for some folks, it's even um, about streaming data analytics. And that's like a whole other <laughs> layer of complexity. But um, just in some of the conversations we've had about designing those experiences, it really goes back to the technology first over the uh, user's experience. Um, Juanis, did you raise your hand? 
Yeah. Um, maybe one thing to, I, I really follow and also a part not, I think volume and amount of data and speed is not really the issue. Um, there are solutions for that, but what you then said is the most important and crucial thing there. It's yeah. making sure that it keeps cost efficient, uh, in this setting. Um, and not too complex that you limit complexity because you're also talking about streaming analytics, streaming insights. We need to rethink sometimes whether we truly need streaming services. Um, if to give an example, I was working at an energy supplier and they stated when someone on our website looks to the price page, that's the moment we know people are considering contracts or changing supplier. So that's the moment we need to send an email. Yet if they, even if at that moment in time they sign a contract at, the, at another supplier, you have a two weeks window to to reconvert them without any issue. Um, yet if you send the email on the moment people are looking on the price page, that's creepy. Um, <laughs> so you truly don't need streaming data to solve that use case. And there's there's multiple more. It's, it's really about thinking what kind of complexity, which amount of data do I truly need to get up until the use case to make the smart decision from a cost perspective. Because from yeah. a technical perspective, the amount of data, the volume, the speed, that's not the issue. We, we can close to do everything, but with a huge amount of complexity or a, a high cost next to it. And it's making wise decisions, balancing those two, that's, that's really important here. Yeah, I agree. Alice, did you want to uh, yeah, I, I hope I tackle this head on rather than skirt around it. So um, um, I think about UX challenges for data analytics, uh, one of the big ones being uh, empathy as a whole um, and um, making sure empathy is baked in um, right from the sources. And I spoke with, as, as you were saying, Karen, about um awareness and workshops and when talking with some of the software engineers one of them about building empathy um one of them said empathy i don't know what that is i'm an engineer i'm not a human mm -hmm. um, and tongue in cheek um and is of course as an individual you are empathetic to your users but as a whole uh, when push comes to shove, your technical requirements or your business requirements become above your um, you, your downstream users who you may not see, um, as one of says directly, there may be one or two data products in the middle there. So building that empathy is a challenge um, for your end users to have and think about them at every aspect, um, I think is um, a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes I've seen the conversation go something like, let's use out of the box analytics, and that's good enough. <laughs> and maybe that's not really what the user needs at the end of the day. Yeah, so great, great feedback. I appreciate that on, on both points. So Luke asked us a question, do you use any data UX specific usability heuristics? Do you find value in existing sets? Nielsen Norman set the understanding group IA, Morville IA. So, um, Alice, do you use some specific usability heuristics for data? Um, I often look at Nielsen Norman um, and his um, um, book on everyday design. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, Dan Norman. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, um, and looking at his usability heuristics is, but I wouldn't use them strictly. So. Um, looking, for example, at affordances, I think is um, one of the key ones I like to use. Um, thinking about how we can, um, particularly on knowing and where to look, um, affordance com becomes um, critical. So very early days um, and nothing is um, streamlined yet in how we approach this, but um, ad hoc usage um definitely helps sorry that's not completely specific because yeah Juanis, how about you uh up front not really 
Um, so in, in the design process from, from the start, not, uh, but what I think is really important is that from that moment on, you start monitoring usage, how are people using it? Why are people using your data and your data product? Because then you can iterate over it. And, and part of data product thinking is that iterative process. Um, so it, it's about monitoring what really happens with it. What is what people are using it, uh, it for up until query level, which fields are being used in your data product and stuff like that to make sure that you can iterate on, on the data product from there on. It would be great to see these, like to get to the point where data usability has become so entrenched as a, in a place in data, um, that we can begin to see the same, um, mythologies used that are used in, for example, designing a front-end app that are used in designing a data product uh, in the same process when it comes to UX. Yeah. But yeah, we're very early still on this. We use these tools often, um, but you know, I'm focusing specifically on the user experience piece now when I say this, not early on in the data, you know, so I guess a backup, we've crossed over from user experience into really like product design territory at the strategic level and the data and the technical level, we've kind of traversed all of these things. And I think that's because, um, you know, at least for me, my background, having been in this industry for such a, a while, you know, I've been in so many different roles on a project, like I've been a developer, been the UI person, been the UX person, the business analyst, and all of that, that it's, it, it just naturally became part of the conversations I was having with clients to, you know, bring that knowledge to, to the topics and to the process and talk about things end to end. And I like having conversations with everyone at every level on a project and hearing like their feedback and what they're, what they're concerned about and, and all of those things. And so that's just kind of how my my career has evolved and um you know that's why i think it's easy to touch on all those other topics but if i'm just focusing in on the ux piece when we're doing user experience design getting to the point where we're doing wireframes and we're taking we always take real data <laughs> real data real content and build out that uh, like a clickable prototype and when we look at heuristics i'm ng is my go-to but i think all of the other ones that you mentioned as well they kind of fall into all of those usability best practices right and creating a learnable system a simple system intuitive system but then looking at um you know can i back out of something that i've done can i save and come back later uh uh you know can i undo you know i already mentioned undoing an action but we're stepping back into a previous step that I've done something in. And I think when we're we're building applications that require a user to do get their work done within that system, they're not just um, going in there and viewing data or downloading data. Um, we do look at all of those things very carefully and focus on it specifically when we're doing the usability testing. So our scenarios, when we walk through usability tests, we love to do um, virtual usability sessions where we have the prototype up on the screen and we um, do something like a Zoom call and we give the user scenarios and they click through the prototype using the scenarios that we've defined. And we ask questions about, you know, how would you back out of this now? You know, how, how would you get back to the beginning or revisit the question, you know, question number three. So it's a great question. And I, I do think it's important, but there's nothing specific to data that I've seen um, to the level that we're talking about here from a heuristic perspective. So room to be innovative, <laughs> create something new, right? Thanks for asking your question, Luke. Uh, so we're almost at time here. We do have uh, oh, a new question. Yay. Hey, Andrew, thanks for asking your question. Uh, DDD microservices data mesh attempt to address scaling software and data teams respectively. Do either or both of these apply to address scaling data UX teams or do the dynamics in the life cycle have different, uh, have unique problem sets to address scale differently? What does scaling mean in a data UX context? So domain-driven design, microservices, data mesh. Sorry, I have to read this twice, Andrew. <laughs> data-driven design, microservices, and data mesh attempt to address scaling software and data teams so do either or both of these apply to address scaling data ux teams or do the dynamics in the life cycle have unique problem sets to address so what does scaling mean in a data ux context so i think 
That's very interesting. I see data UX as being a part of these other things that you've defined, not something outside of it necessarily, but I have to think about your question here. Attempt to address scaling software and teams. I think that for me, UX is part of the, you know, if we think about the data mesh journey, for example, to me, what I love about data mesh is the idea of bringing people together. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to click answer last. Okay. Um, it's part of bringing people together and getting people in different disciplines talking to each other. So from that perspective, um, I don't know if that's what you're referring to as scaling. And as I'm talking, Andrew, feel free to, free to add um, more here to clarify your question if I'm not answering the right question. But I, I think scaling the impact of UX is possible through following a data mesh methodology um, and domain-driven design, if that's what you meant, instead of data-driven design, I'm not sure which one you're referring to there. Um, you know, I think that's part of it as well, right? It's really going out and talking and expanding the scope of who's involved in these conversations when you're looking at what you're trying to build, who you're building it for, developing empathy, right, for people in different roles in the organization and how what you're building from a product perspective impacts them, whether they're the people who are uh, creating the data, the data producers, or they're the data consumers. So I'll hand it over to um, Juanis and Alice and see what your thoughts are there. Yeah, the, the same thing, a uh, bit struggling to to really grasp what, uh, what is being meant with the question. Um, yeah, if you look to microservices and data mesh, I think in a similar way, they're trying to solve issues within software engineering or data engineering. And if you see to user experience, what micro, how microservices impact user experience, I think not that much. It's a bit about who has the responsibility about certain elements on your website, for example. Um, but in the end, that means you somehow need to combine user experience thinking for just a tiny part, but also having the global oversight. And I think that's the most important thing here. Um, for example, looking to a website, you, ha you have someone who can help think on the color of a certain button and you're going to A-B test that and stuff like that. And that's purely responsibility of one microservice who somehow need to have their own user experience expert, but you also have someone designing the end state, the, the global overview. And I think that's the same thing applies to, to, uh, to data mesh and scaling data UX here for every data product within your chain, you have someone thinking, uh, how do my consumers, how do my users use my data product and what do I need to, to get in there? But you also need to have someone thinking about the entire value chain. Um, what do we need to capture in the beginning to make sure that in the end state where it's a, a dashboard user or someone else, I, I, I can show this data. Um, so I think that's the main change by going decentralized versus centralized in both settings is that you have both local and global UX involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Um, looking at both on the macro and a micro level, uh, the, because it, we're basically trying to build and emphasize, uh, cross-functional teams, I guess. So making sure ux a, a data ux specialist uh, is in a team in at the right place at the right time um will help uh and and like you say with the buttons um yeah if, if you think not in a data perspective but in um uh yeah a nuclear power plant they will have or, or a drill platform uh, they will have a human factor teams there to help design the systems so that the technical experts using them will um, will have the the buttons in the right place um, at the right time and in the right color so that if something happens that they they can manage it to the best of their human abilities have have we got these uh, data ux teams for our systems with them uh, uh with, yeah sorry with data um, are we designing the human factors of our systems, um, both in microservices and in 
data architecture, data analytics, um, and in data products. The way I, as you were talking, it, I, it kind of occurred to me, so the way that I've seen this addressed actually in organizations that have a really large product that's very data heavy is there's typically a centralized team that's focused on the user experience and there's a very big design system. And in that design system, there are components that have been, you know, pre-vetted and tested for accessibility, um, for usability. And the that's kind of where I think the, um, scalability of user experience can occur. Like if you have multiple products within your organization that are leveraging the data from multiple sources and you have a large scale design system that has all of the components that know how to handle that data and present it to the consumers in the right way, that's, that's like an usable and accessible, then you have kind of baked into that, that design system, all of the best practices that are taking into consideration things like empathy and um, the intent of uh, how people want to interact with and use that data. And beyond just the component level of the design system, there are best practices around things like, hey, anytime we're presenting data in a data table, we automatically know that we're going to have some additional metadata that people want to see, but we can't fit all the metadata in a table. And, you know, how do we want to handle that gracefully? Are we using side panels? Are, you know, are data tables really the right way for people to consume this information. So some of those decisions are already made from the UX team's perspective and take into consideration things like um, some of the heuristics potentially, depending on what kind of component it is. So I think that's another place that we can look for how to scale best practice around data user experience. Okay, so thanks again for that question. So we're um, we're at three oh six. So we're we're past our panel discussion Q and A portion um, to answer the questions that we came up with. But I uh, encourage anyone else who has a question to go ahead and answer it now. Uh, I mean, ask it now, <laughs> so we can answer those questions for you. Um, we do have a couple more questions in our document that we could um, go to and answer if if everyone's open to doing that. Is that okay with uh, you, Alice and and Juanis? We can hang on the call for a little bit longer and give people a chance to ask questions if they'd like. Uh, so the next question that we have here is, how do you approach the user experience for a system that is leveraging data from multiple sources, different domains or data products? So this is something that's been really common, you know, nowadays, like when we're talking about data, it's not just one source. <laughs> it's, you know, there's source data everywhere and you're trying to pull it together into one UI. Um, are oftentimes multiple UIs are all using multiple data sources. So how um, how do you approach these user experience in those situations? Uh, I'll start. Um, I, I think in the beginning, it's important to look not really to source systems, but to domains. Um, also in a data mesh setting, I think it's very valuable to think of um what actually belongs together what is one data product living in one domain even if it covers multiple data products um to go back to the to the same example the dpg media data mesh story we started in a subscription system and the use case they suddenly were able to do thanks to having data engineers in their team was to enclose five subscription systems into one data product offering it back to a contact center um, mm -hmm. So even though it's multiple data sources from the start within your data landscape, it's one data product and it belongs to one domain. So that's, I think that's the the differentiator here, not necessarily the, the data source yet the domain. How do you cope with data coming from multiple domains and you need to get them together to get one insight you, you want? That's a valid question as, as well. Um, there it's about making sure that people connect, um, making sure that those data products can be combined interoperable, same granular level as we've been talking before, so that you can combine them, um, and put the responsibility of combining them to those that actually want to have this product. So more in the consumer oriented space, um, making sure that always someone at least requires this solution um and thinking the entire pipeline through yeah great point i agree and we did touch on a lot of that in our call today yeah <laughs> alice how about you what are your thoughts here i i'm not sure how much i can add to it because i think that was uh, 
a great answer. I think we could look at the the architecture and how um, making sure that we aren't becoming too centralized if we're um, combining the data product um, into too many sources, but mirroring it into the the bounded context and and bringing in um, domain driven design um, when looking at building this um, will yeah so I think that's but because there's there's a fantastic article sorry I'm trying to remember who who wrote it because I can't say his name I know that he works at Microsoft um, and he wrote about um, the um, where we should like the different designs of um in data mesh and ha how orthodox um you can get with data mesh and and how this would affect your teams as well so do you if if either of you remember who i'm talking about when he wrote about this um if it's it, microsoft i'm guessing it's peter and stringhold yes uh, see scott <laughs> confirming it in the chat yes yeah and it was <laughs> um yes his article so that that's what i think of and i wouldn't be able to explain it better than him so i can only refer to that if that's that answers the question of course but that's that's what i think of. Mm -hmm. for uh for us i think we we approach the user experience with multi-source data systems uh by going to the users and talking to them to understand what they're trying to do with this data and do they really need like do we need to concatenate? Do we need this data together in some way? Or can you experience it separately, right? Just because we have multiple sources for one system doesn't mean they need to see it like together um, in the experience. So, um, you know, a dashboard's an obvious example of that, but also um, content and data can live together, right? So we might have charts and information and financials about a company um, from an MA perspective if we're looking at that in a knowledge system and we might show Here's all of the information about the performance of this company, investments, you know, seed funding, Series A funding, and so on and so forth. And um, we might also have information about the products that they sell, uh, revenue, and then looking at um, content about them that we pull from, you know, Wikipedia or whatever, right? So that's all information and data coming from different systems, but it can fit really nicely in um, a an experience just like our Google search results do. And they use knowledge panels and all of these different ways of presenting information. So anytime we're looking at multiple sources of data, we wanna first just ask the users, you know, what, what do you want here? Why do you need it? What's the journey? Who are the people that are accessing this information? And then we start, um, the second part of it is looking at, um, you know, what metadata is available around all of the data so that we can understand again, how to present it, how do you make it findable? Metadata is often what turns into facets in a search experience, right? And, and helps increase uh, wayfinding if we're using it in any of the navigation or breadcrumbs and things like um, of, the, of that nature. So that's how we kind of begin that journey. And that's outside of the data mesh conversation, but really just focused in on the user experience piece of it. So we don't have any other questions at this point. Um, it's about 312, I think we're we're all wrapped up, but thank you everyone for attending and we're gonna have a recording of this available uh, at shortly. You know, Scott will take care of posting this, but thanks everyone for attending again. And thank you Juanis for being here and answering questions and talking about UX. And thank you as well, Alice. It's a pleasure to chat with both of you this afternoon or this evening because that's, it's like where you are. <laughs> Likewise, and thanks for, uh talking us together, Karen. Yeah, no, my pleasure. And thank you, Scott. I know you're out there. <laughs> yes, thanks. Yes, thanks. All right, bye-bye.